Lecture 21, I call it the world system. Uh, this is uh, an ideal from Emmanuel Wallerstein, a sociologist. Remember we talked about interdisciplinary uh, methods when we began this class. Wallerstein argues that there is a world economic system in which some countries benefit while other countries are exploited uh, for their cheap labor and natural resources. Wallerstein uh, posits a three-level hierarchy uh, at the center of things, what he calls the core, uh, and then along the periphery of that core, and then a, a semi-periphery. So let's look at this in a little more detail. Core countries are dominant capitalist countries that exploit peripheral countries for cheap labor and raw materials. Core countries have high levels of urbanization, high wages, high technology production. Peripheral countries are dependent on core countries for capital and have underdeveloped industry. Many peripheral countries are found in Africa and South America. Peripheral countries have lower literacy rates. Uh, they're more agrarian or more agricultural. Peripheral countries are exploited by the core for their cheap labor, raw materials, and agricultural production. Uh, Semi-peripheral countries have characteristics of both, both the core and the periphery. Uh, some examples. The United States is, is a good example of a core country. The U.S. has vast amounts of capital and labor. India is an example of a semi-peripheral country. India is largely dependent on foreign investors for capital. Uh, this is changing. India has a growing technology industry and an emerging middle class consumer market, much like Western Europe, uh, China, uh, Japan, and the United States. Um, and then another example, Cape Verde is a peripheral country where foreign investors allow for the extraction of raw materials and the production of cash crops for export to wealthier consumer markets in core countries. Uh, let's break this theory down a little bit. Um, according to Wallerstein, capitalism has had a division of labor that encompassed several nation states. Uh, according to Wallerstein, the world system began in Europe about 1500. Uh, the accumulation of capital allowed Europeans to expand over the entire globe. Establishment of a world economy based on an extremely unequal division of labor between European states and the rest of the system. Strong military institutions were developed to enforce this inequality. The world system is contested as peripheral countries gain their independence and assert their national interest against the core. Uh, India breaking free from uh, British rule, uh, Cuba uh, severing the long-term uh, relationship with the United States as sort of a protectorate or a colony. Uh, we see endless examples of this in the latter part of the 20th century uh, where in, in the imperial powers waned and their colonies asserted themselves. And this, of course, is the first step towards uh, leaving the periphery and moving toward the core. Uh, I mentioned Janet Abu Lagood in our, one of our uh, introductory lectures. Uh, she argues that Wallerstein's world system should be pushed back into the 13th and 14th centuries. Uh, she argues that the Mongol trade circuit um, constitutes uh, an earlier world system, earlier than Wallerstein's uh, 15th century. Uh, Lagood argues that uh, this world system uh, followed Islamic trade, uh, that circuit uh, throughout Eurasia. And of course, we talked about this earlier. Uh, so just a couple of conclusions here for this short lecture. A large-scale economic and social model of understanding how and why power is dispersed across the globe. So this is probably Wallerstein's, uh, the, the, um, what we can take from Wallerstein's argument is a way to sort of uh, conceptualize uh, where wealth and power lie 
and uh, the relationship between core countries and uh, those countries on the periphery. Uh, for world history, Wallerstein's system tends to ignore peoples on the periphery, those that lie outside traditional civilizations and modern nation states. And of course, when we study world history, we have to take into account those nomadic peoples uh, like we did in the last couple of lectures when we discussed the Mongols. The Mongols have uh, no large urban areas. There are nomadic people on the move. Uh, does this mean we shouldn't study them? Well, obviously not. They had a dramatic impact on world history. So world history system, uh, it allows us to conceptualize uh, power and uh, wealth, uh, but it tends to negate uh, peoples that uh, are traditionally sort of uh, ignored. Uh, we don't ignore them any longer. Uh, that's one of the reasons that world history has become a major field, is uh, an attempt to include uh, peoples otherwise left out. So I want you to keep Wallerstein's world system model in mind as we move forward. Thank you.